Good morning, church family, and welcome to worship today on this Sunday, June 14th. We hope that the love and peace of Jesus is full in your hearts and your homes today. I believe this is about the 12th uh, take that I have attempted for this part of the service, so hopefully I can get it right this time and learn how to talk. A few announcements uh, for us before we begin our worship service. Uh, just a reminder that we can now produce CDs and DVDs of our worship services for those who aren't able to access them here on our YouTube channel. So please contact us if you know of anyone that would like to receive those resources from week to week. A reminder that tomorrow, June 15th, is the deadline for the Jack and Cleo Austin Senior Scholarship. That, uh, as a reminder, is for all college students entering and current. Those applications can be emailed to Joey or myself, to Shannon Hill or Mr. Rufus Langley. Thank you for your continued support uh, for the ministries of our church through your giving. Remember that checks can be mailed to the church office here at PO Box 177. You can also give online through the conference website. That link is below in the video description and you can set up automatic bank draft with your local branch. Thank you for your support and faithfulness in that area. Lastly, tonight we have a youth group Zoom session at 6 p.m. and we invite all of our youth and any parents or volunteers that would like to join us for just a few moments to see one another and catch up and pray together. So we hope to see you youth tonight at 6 p.m. That link has been emailed out, uh, but if you do need that, please contact me and I'll be happy to share that with you. Those are all of our announcements, so let us begin worship with a word of prayer. Holy God, we thank you for the opportunity and privilege it is to worship together again today. We do not use that word together lightly. We know that it has taken on more meaning over the past few months, Lord, and how we long to be together in person to worship and hope that that day will come soon. But we still give thanks that today we are still connected together and bound by your love. You are the tie that binds us, Lord Jesus, and we thank you that we are brothers and sisters in your family, all united uh, in worship and love for you. Empower us through our worship that we may be filled with your spirit and go out into the harvest field as your workers, joyfully to do your work, to proclaim the good news of your kingdom, to love and to serve. May we uh, do this with humility and peace and compassion, and may you continue uh, to teach us and mold us into your disciples, to who you fully made us to be. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for loving us first through Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Oh, no. 
We have two scripture passages from Matthew's Gospel today. The first one is chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness. When He saw the crowds, He had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then He said to His disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into His harvest. And our second passage from Matthew 10, verses 5 through 32. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, now give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. See, I am sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of them, for they will hand you over to councils and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings because of me, as a testimony to them and the Gentiles. When they hand you over, do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you at that time. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all because of my name. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly, I tell you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes." A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher, and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground and unperceived by your Father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid." You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. A portion of God's Word has been read for us, God's people. Thanks be to God. Up until now, in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus has been the only missionary. But at this point, He calls His disciples and readies them to be sent out into the harvest, which Jesus claims is ripe for the picking. 
Jesus gathers the 12, and we remember, of course, that that number 12 is a sacred number, an important number. Matthew is primarily writing his gospel for a Jewish audience, and so that number would have been significant, referring to the 12 tribes of Israel, and so now Jesus has picked 12 disciples. In addition to that, Matthew has Jesus serve as a kind of new Moses who goes up on the mount to preach and teach, whereas Moses went up on Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments. But it's important for us to realize also that the number 12 also refers to us. We are the 12. We are those that Jesus has now called and commissioned to go out into the world to share His message of love and to heal and to cast out demons and to do the work of Christ's kingdom. Harvesting, in our passage, refers to reaching out to people who need to know about the good news of Jesus that God has sent into the world. But also, it's about sharing that love in many different kinds of practical, everyday ways, such as healing, such as meeting the needs of people, and calling out and casting out demons. Notice that we are sent into the harvest. The church has always been a go people rather than a come people. We're called to go into the world rather than to wait for people to come to us. I think of the words of Howard Hendricks who once said, I can't find a single verse of scripture that commands a lost person to go to church, but I can find many verses of scripture that commands believers to go into a lost world. We are called to be proactive, we're called to be creative and passionate in the Lord's work. Jesus went about seeking out people and their needs. He engaged them in conversations and spent time with them. He had a deep love and compassion and empathy for people whose life especially was difficult and who were going through bad things and having difficult experiences. He saw the crowds hurting, alone, lost, and without direction, and he often compared them to being like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus went to them, engaged them, and he sends his disciples to to share that same kind of empathy and love and compassion for people, to have love for people in our hearts. And if we're truly disciples of Jesus, then we will express that kind of empathy and compassion for those who are having a difficult time of it in this world. I think of Bill Hybels' distinction between discontent and holy discontent. Discontent, he says, is when you or I watch a terrible event unfold on television, and we we remark that something ought to be done about that, and then in, in turn we quickly take the remote and turn to the movie of the week. Holy discontent, he says, is when you or I watch that same event and it wrecks us. It's like a wrecking ball to our heart. It's when God seizes us so that we put down the remote control and feel an urgency to respond. Certainly the image this past couple of weeks of the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis would be one of those kinds of wrecking moments. That image and what occurred in Minneapolis has has hit our hearts like a wrecking ball. And we've experienced all kinds of emotions in the wake of that. Frustration, anger, shame, horror, a a tragedy like that could happen in our world and in our nation in 2020. We can't believe that something like that has been happening and continues to go on. And we think to ourselves, something has to be done. And we think about how we are called to bring change and to work towards racial reconciliation. Jesus calls his disciples to action. We are sent into the harvest. Now, of course, we can choose not to respond. We can choose not to go. We can choose to remain in our discontent rather than wholly discontent. We can choose to remain comfortable or complacent. We can look at the world and all of its pain and all of its troubles, and we can repeat to ourselves, well, things really aren't that bad. Or we might say, well, things have always been like that and will continue until Jesus comes. Or we might say, this doesn't really concern me or impact my life. Or we might say, you know, I'm already so busy and life is hard enough as it is. I have more than I can do already on my plate. 
Adrian Rogers once told a story of a lady who took a course in first aid and she was meeting with her her classmates in a support group and they were talking about that and having some testimonials about how they had put their training into practice and she stood up and said I would like to share a testimony if you if you would please the other day I was out in front of my house and there was a terrible automobile accident an old man driving his car lost control ran over the curb and ran into a large oak tree head-on he was thrown out onto the street. His skull was fractured. He had many broken limbs. His lifeblood was seeping out of him onto the asphalt. Fractures everywhere. But it was a horrible thing, she said. But I remembered my first aid. I remembered that I had been taught that if I sat down and put my head between my legs, I would not faint. Now, Adrian Rogers goes on to say, that may be the kind of Christianity a lot of people desire. We just want to put our head between our knees and take care of ourselves and say, oh, I'm so glad I'm a Christian and that Jesus is with me and that I can live my life in this horrible world. But it's at those times that we're reminded that the Lord has put us in this world as His representatives. We are sent into the harvest to go and make this world better and to bring in the kingdom of God. Jesus sends us out to proclaim His love, to serve the needs of others, to heal, to cast out demons, to bring hope to everyone that we meet. Now, our first priority, of course, is to help people know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, to save souls and to bring people into a relationship, a personal and intimate friendship with Jesus. But we're also called to a ministry not only of the soul and the spirit, to a ministry of the body. People are human beings, one entities. We are bodies. We are both body and soul, as C.S. Lewis said. And we're called to minister to the whole person. Now, as United Methodist Christians, we have a long history and legacy of working to rid our society of its ills and its pains and problems. We believe in a holiness of heart and life. And Mr. Wesley even said that there is no holiness apart from social holiness. John Wesley himself worked tirelessly to help clothe and feed and to minister to the needs of the poor. He helped and wrote about caring for the sick. He visited those in prison, particularly those in debtor's prison, who were there oftentimes because they had very small debts, but because there was such a lack of unemployment, they couldn't pay their debts and get out and take care of their families. And he worked tirelessly to rid his world of the social evil of slavery that we have been under a curse of ever since. We are called to battle the major sources of harm that continue to exist in our world. Now, if you're like me, and sometimes battle the demon of anxiety and can get easily overwhelmed by the vast number of needs in the world and maybe repeat to yourself sometimes in the darkness, what in the world can I do? How can I make a difference? There's so much to do and we all want to do something. I want to comfort us by saying that no one can and should attempt to do everything. That's not what Jesus calls us to do. But He does call us to do something. And I believe that we can start where God's Spirit touches our heart. Start where we're wrecked. Start where that wrecking ball hits your heart. Start with Jesus' love. What does His love prompt us to do? And go and do the next right thing. I like to refer to, it helps my anxiety and my sense of being overwhelmed, to use the phrase, start within your realm of influence. We all have a world of relationships and contacts and places where we work and we play and we engage with other people. If you see a need, let the Spirit of God give you the courage to take, to take a step, to take action. Remember Jesus has given us the Holy Spirit that's alive within us, that compels us to go and to live for Him. And remember in the story the disciples went out in great power and authority and they were able to do miracles. They did things that they never imagined they would be able to do. And God still works those miracles through people just like us. 
What about those demons? Let's talk about those demons for just a little bit. Now, demons and that kind of language sounds a little archaic to us, maybe intimidating and scary. When we think of demons, we may think of devils and imps and uh, evil spirits, and we can have a tendency as modern people to be a little bit dismissive about that. However, there are modern day demons in the world. Food insecurity is a demon for someone who is hungry. Addiction is a demon that strips someone's life and freedoms away. Joblessness is a demon in that it doesn't allow people to be responsible and to take care of their families and meet their responsibilities. Illness, cancer is a demon. Grinding poverty is a demon. Hatred is a demon. God empowers you and me, His servants, to cast out demons. And there is real evil in the world. We can, now listen to this, we can exercise our faith and exorcise demons. Like greed and selfishness and hate and excessive pride and privilege. God will use us and our lives and our words in mighty ways to not only share the love of Jesus and to tell people about how Jesus came and lived for us and died for us and rose again that we might be free of our sins, but He will also use us to destroy and dismantle those devilish attitudes and spirits and sins and behaviors that corrupt and that destroy God's world. For instance, Within our sphere of influence and our realm, we can listen and learn from the stories of other people, particularly people who may have been raised differently or in different conditions and had different experiences than us. We can learn from conversations with our black and brown friends about what life has been like for them. We can read a book written by someone who's had a different experience of life. We can engage in conversation with someone who disagrees with us and our views and learn about where they're coming from. We can respond to racial slurs and offensive remarks by being brave enough to speak up among our family and our friends and our loved ones. If we are an employer, maybe we would consider hiring a minority person for a job and give that person a chance. We can welcome an immigrant. We can befriend a stranger. Remember, God is with us as His representatives in the world to help us live out ways if we will open our minds and our eyes and our hearts and yield ourselves to the Spirit and go into the harvest and the Spirit and love of Jesus. Love heals. Love heals hearts, it heals minds, it heals bodies, and it heals souls. Accepting others restores lives. Forgiving sets people free. Learning and respecting others cast out demons. Sharing our resources and our blessings with those in need works miracles and answers the desperate prayers of others. Now, as they are sent out into the harvest, Jesus tells His disciples in verses 8 through 10 to take no gold, or silver, or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, no two coats or tunics or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food, he says. Now, does that mean that we are to declare ourselves impoverished, that we're to take a vow of poverty? No, it doesn't mean that we're to do that. Then we would only become part of a greater problem. But it does mean that Jesus calls us to trust Him he calls us to simplify our lives and to let our lives and our values witness to His place in our lives. Discipleship is a lifestyle. In the words of George Lorimer, it's good to have money in all the ways that money can help us. We know that and recognize that and that's important. But it is also good to check on ourselves once in a while and make sure that we haven't lost the things that money can't buy. The way we live makes a statement on what's important in our lives. I would even suggest that we could go and open our checkbooks if, if we still use those, if some of us still have those, and we'd be able to see probably where lots of our values and our interests really lie. 
If Jesus is a part of our lives, we're going to trust Him and we're going to put Him first and we're going to trust Him to meet our needs. And if we live in trust and modify our, our words and, and our wants and live below our means, then we'll be free to use the blessings we've been given to help make a better world. We can exorcise the demon of debt, which can be uh, a huge problem in our lives as well. Now, Jesus knows we have needs and responsibilities, and disciples do not ignore the realities of life. However, doing the work of the Lord becomes more important to His followers than consumption and possession of things. I remember reading some years ago that the acclaimed and Christian author John Grisham once said that my wife and I measure success each year by what we have given away, not by what we have made. Now, granted, John Grisham is a wealthy person. He's worked very hard, I'm sure, to attain that. And that may sound a little insensitive to those who are struggling during these weeks and maybe have lost jobs. But I think the principle applies. We measure success in life as Christians by what we're able to do for others, not so much by what we're able to do for ourselves. More than this, Jesus says to those who are sent, His disciples in verse 16, See, I am sending you out like sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as uh, serpents and innocent as doves. You know, sheep and wolves are mortal enemies. Wolves want to eat sheep. That's their job and that's their goal in life. So Jesus is saying the harvest can be a dangerous place. You can expect persecutions. Remember in the Sermon on the Mount, early in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for my sake, for your reward will be great. So as Christians, as persons who value God's kingdom and work for that in the world, we can expect some opposition. We can expect our efforts sometimes and our beliefs and our convictions and our work to be rejected, to be ridiculed, and to be condemned. We may offend others. Following Jesus, He will soon say in the coming verses, may separate us from our family members. We may find ourselves brother against brother or sister separated from sister or parent from child or friend from friend. Jesus is saying these are hard sayings and this is the reality of life. But we have to put Him first and above all else. Kingdom values may put us in opposition to the people that are closest to us and that we love most dearly. Some people may feel that other people are not as worthy of God's love as some others or don't deserve it. Some time ago, an amazing group of women called the Little Sisters of the Poor dedicated to serving those who are poor and in need, opened a soup kitchen and a bread line for the homeless and the poorest of the poor in Cincinnati, Ohio. And these nuns received no salaries and no uh, benefits for their work. They simply depend upon the donations of neighbors and friends and businesses. They go from house to house and business to business acting for, asking for donations of money and food so that they can feed the poorest of the poor in their city. One day, one of those sisters reported that she went to a grocer and asked for the outdated food that he sold. The grocer spit in her face. She said to him, Thank you, sir. That was for me. Now can I please have something to help the poor? Following Jesus sometimes causes us to behave in radically different ways from what we may have expected that to be. And sometimes when we are a faithful disciple of Jesus, we will bring out the worst. We will bring out the demons in the lives of other people. Not everyone wants to do what is right. And everyone, Jesus said, Everyone who says, Lord, Lord, may not be as ready to enter the kingdom as they think they are. In verse 24, Jesus says that the disciple is not above the master, continuing this theme of how dangerous and difficult it can be sometimes to be a true disciple and follower of Jesus. When Jesus says the slave is not above the master, he means, look at what happened to me, eating with sinners and outcasts, 
offending the religious leaders, speaking truth to power and threatening the powers of the government leaders, disturbing the status quo and the life of the privileged can get you pinned to a cross like an insect in an insect collection. Don't expect life to be different for you than it was for me if you truly love me. But then in verse 26, Jesus says, Have no fear of them. The them here is a reference to the wolves, those who oppose my kingdom, those who criticize and reject and make fun and hurt others and might and even would hurt you, those who prefer the darkness and not the light, those who have become comfortable and complacent rather than wholly discontented, Someday everything will come to the light. It will be out in the open. And no untruth, no secrets, and no sins will be hidden. The light will prevail. Do not fear those who can hurt the body, but fear those who can destroy the soul. Jesus is reassuring us today that we don't have to fear anyone or anything not even death, because the worst thing that can happen to us is death, and Jesus took care of that for us on Easter morning. The only thing we should fear is God. And this fear, it doesn't mean to be afraid of. It doesn't mean that we're to, to be afraid or distant from God. It means that we have a reverential respect and awe for the one who made us and made the world, and that God is God and we are not, and He is in charge and He is in control. And only He can destroy the soul. Only God can destroy a soul in hell. We don't have to be afraid in this difficult and sometimes horrible world because Jesus is with us and loves us. He knows how many hairs we have on our head. Can you imagine He can count the hairs on our head? He knows, he says, when one sparrow falls from the sky, and if he knows the life of a tiny bird, then how much more does he care about us and know about us and what we go through every day? He will be with us, and he will take care of us as we bravely go into the harvest to proclaim the love of Jesus, to help and to heal the sick and the hurting, to cast out the demons of our world. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.
Let us pray together, brothers and sisters, as those sent into the harvest for Jesus' sake. Creator God, when faced with your miraculous love, we often question our worthiness to receive it. And when faced with opportunities to share your grace and love in the world, we often retreat out of fear sometimes. When faced with your invitation to join in the harvest, we often close our doors to the needy or close our minds to new ideas or fail to see the things that we can do to make a better world. We focus our ministries inward oftentimes to serve our needs and the needs of our own people rather than outward to meet the needs of others. We ask for your forgiveness and for the strength and courage to turn away from fear and selfish motives and to go into the world to be used by you. Help us, Lord, every day to wake up and think to ourselves, what can I do to share the love of Jesus today and make someone's life better and bring about the kingdom in the world that Jesus loves and came to save? I pray, Lord, that you will bless all of us in this time of confusion and frustration and anger and a time also when we're seeing many miracles of reconciliation and we're seeing lives and hearts changed. In this seminal moment in our nation and the world, we pray that you will be at work in us and in all people to create the kind of world that you want us to have and to live in. We pray you'll open our hearts anew and that we'll have the courage every moment and every day to serve you, Lord. And that we will, like the disciples, discover that we too can do miracles and that you do amazing things through willing souls. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.